Welcome to Washington Street United Methodist Church, a church with heart and the heart of the city of Columbia, South Carolina. I'm so glad that you have joined us today for our time of virtual worship. I'm excited to announce that beginning on October the 4th, we will have an outdoor worship service every other week, October 4th, October 18th, November 1st, and November 15th, so that we can gather for in-person worship in our wonderful parking lot. It doesn't sound appealing, but I hope you'll agree with me that having an opportunity to come together in the name of Christ to celebrate the sacrament and to worship the Lord together will truly be a blessing. We will continue to bring to you our virtual worship experience each week at wsmethodist.org, and I invite you to continue to worship with us to visit our website and enjoy our devotionals, to join our Bible studies, our Sunday school classes, and to connect with us as we continue to strive to connect with our community and with the world in mission. And now in the name of Jesus Christ, let us worship the Lord. And now, please join me in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for being ever present with us. We know that we are never alone. Your mercies have been faithful and rich. Pour out your spirit upon us that we might do the work of your will. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, to grace, how 
Please join me as we listen now to the Word of God from Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Clearly, a journey through the wilderness is no fun. It's like driving through the back roads of Virginia at 2 o'clock in the morning, where there's absolutely no place to stop for a break or to get a cup of coffee. It's like that 16-hour flight to Africa, during which they tell you repeatedly, do not get out of your seat, even when you stop for a one-hour layover. It's like those 11 days without power after Hurricane Hugo when you cook on a camp stove, you eat what's at hand, and you hope and pray that it will soon be over. The Hebrew people were beyond tired. They were weary to the bone. They were constantly battling hunger and thirst, exhaustion, and as Austin referred to last week, their constant battle with trust issues. They were persistently afraid that perhaps the Lord had really abandoned them in this wilderness. They must have been too exhausted to take another step to have stopped and camped at Rephidim. There was not a water supply anywhere nearby. They were surrounded simply by the sand the brush, and the rocks of the wilderness. As bleak as this situation sounds, it's a rather endearing passage. I kind of love the way that Moses and God talk. The way they talk together about how the people are complaining, how they're having issues with Moses and with their trust and their fear. And then Moses bluntly spells out his frustration with these people whom God has called him to lead through this wilderness journey. They talk like old pals. And like a conversation between old friends, it ends very well. God told Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Strike the rock. Those words reminded me of a passage in the New Testament. Jesus told his followers Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice 
is like a wise person who built their house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Today, Jesus invites us to strike the rock of our faith, to take all of the tools at hand that God has given to us and to strike to the very foundations of our faith. At the core of your being, who is Jesus to you? You know, Jesus asked Peter on the road to Caesarea Philippi, who do you say that I am? In the wilderness of this pandemic, when many of our lives have been turned upside down, when our practice of faith has been restructured, shifted, reorganized, when our, our whole faith journey has been moved to a virtual platform, he invites us to strike the right, the rock of our faith. And to answer that question once again, who do you say that I am? We give Jesus many names, but who is Jesus to you? For me, he is the companion teacher who transformed my life. Yes, all those historical names apply. Redeemer, Savior, the Incarnate One, the Bread of Life, the Son of God. But for me, at the core, at the very foundation of my faith, Jesus is the one who transforms life. He takes common fishermen and transforms them into apostles. Jesus took the man who denied him and transformed him into the rock upon which he built his church. Jesus transformed his culture and he really transformed the world. In his brief lifetime, Jesus lifted women and children to a place of dignity when in most circles they were treated as little more than chattel. People who were ostracized because of sickness and disease, Jesus lifted up and he transformed their lives when he deemed them worthy of healing. For them, and for the world, Jesus is a transformer. Jesus invites us to strike the rock of our faith and to answer the tough, tough question, who do you say that I am? The Apostle Paul always encouraged his readers to remember what they had been taught. Sometimes he was referring specifically to scripture and other times he was referring to what he had taught them. And he was often quoted as saying that they should imitate him. Many people think that Paul was a little arrogant and a bit presumptuous to make such a statement. But actually Paul is pointing to a tool that is ready at hand. Our memory, our mentors, our teachers, and our leaders. We've all had people who've influenced the way we think about who God is and about who Jesus is. I always see Jesus with his arms wide open. I learned that from Harry Paler. Harry was the superintendent of Sunday school in my home church when I was just a child. And every Sunday, he would stand in the hallway of our Sunday school building, and he would, when he would see you, he would crouch down and throw his arms wide open and just wait for you to come and jump into his arms, where he would greet you with a 
embrace of love. Harry taught me that Jesus welcomed everyone just like that. Jesus talked to his disciples and his followers about how John the Baptist had been treated and about he, how he had been treated. He told them, you know, John came to you as an ascetic, one who lived apart, who ate locust and wild honey, and they accused him of having a demon. And of course, we know that John was finally executed by Herod. He said, and then I come and you accuse me of being a glutton and a drunkard and eating with sinners and welcoming the tax collectors. Well, Jesus did do those things because he opened his arms to everyone. He held his arms wide open to those people who were religious people from the synagogue, to people like Matthew and Zacchaeus, who had abandoned the ways of God and had embraced the ways of Rome. He even opened his arms wide to those people in the community whom others had marginalized and labeled as sinners. Jesus held his arms wide open to everyone because God wants to welcome everyone to this holy family of God's love. There are people along your faith journey like Harry Paler. There are people who taught you who Jesus is. There are people who helped you discover what it means to love and to be loved by God. Jesus invites you to take the tool of memory in hand and to strike the rock of your faith to remember what it is at the core of your being that you believe most deeply about Him. At the core of my faith is a deep appreciation of God as the one who creates. People who know me see that in the ways in which I talk about my morning walks and how I marvel at everything and every creature I see. I started thinking about where I first learned that lesson. I think I learned it from Lena Stewart. She was my third grade Sunday school teacher. One year, she invited our Sunday school class to her mini farm for our Easter egg hunt. It was quite an adventure. We all showed up with our little baskets and it was the first time I'd ever been allowed to collect eggs from the chicken coop. She taught us that day about how to be gentle and how to take care of the nest. And a few minutes later, she took us over to the pen where her husband kept goats. And yes, we each got to milk the goats. And at the end of our milking session, it was a sloppy time, we were given a little cup of warm, frothy, fatty milk to drink. Almost every one of us took a sip and made an ugly face. But in that moment, she looked at us and she reminded us that even if you do not like the taste of the milk, you must appreciate the creature who gave it. Creation is God's handiwork. And it's like a fine piece of art, valued not for what it does, but for what it is. That is foundational to my faith. And when I strike that rock, it transforms the way I think of every individual, every creature, the earth, my use of natural resources, and all the handiwork of God. Strike the rock of your faith. What is there at the core that you believe about God the Creator, 
Christ the Redeemer, and the sustaining Holy Spirit. Immerse yourself with all the tools that God has given you to plumb the depths of your faith. There are so many tools at hand. Our scripture, our hymnody, our communities of faith, the creeds, the writings of the apostles and the prophets and the early church fathers, and the tomes that have been written about how to live a faithful Christian life. All you need to do is look in a Sunday school class or a small group, and you'll discover that there are places where you can learn and grow because God has given you magnificent tools to use. Tools that are just right here at our fingertips. These are the tools that help us plumb the foundations of our faith. Tools to help us strike the rock. The wilderness is never a fun place to be. It's where circumstance or the crisis of the moment threaten the stability of our faith. It's where the temporal need of this world often shift to try to take priority over the spiritual needs that we have. The wilderness is where despair attempts to overthrow hope. The wilderness is where we are tempted to be people who are less than the individuals that God has called us to be. That's what happened to Jesus in the wilderness of temptation. The devil tempted him to be a miracle worker rather than to be the bread of life. The devil tempted him to pursue power rather than to be the obedient and humble son of God. The devil tempted him to secure wealth rather than to live a life that was full of adoration and service to God. But Jesus struck the rock of his faith. Jesus turned back the temptation. As he recalled the words that he had learned in the synagogue, the words from the Torah, as he had learned how to live as the prophets had taught him, as he remembered how Mary and Joseph had nurtured him in faith and how what God had taught him as God walked with him as father and son. Jesus struck the rock of his faith and he was able to take those tools at hand and walk through the wilderness into that place where he led a purposeful and obedient life. A life that transforms all other lives. Now is the time to strike the rock of our faith and to drink deeply from the wellsprings of that foundation. God is waiting for you and for me at the rock. Let us continue our journey together in faith and in hope, taking the tools that God has given us to make this journey in hope. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, let us pray. God, we are thirsty for you. We are tiring of this journey. The fatigue of the last months is wearing us down. We ask, is the Lord among us? We know you have worked miracles for us before. You have saved us. 
God of miracles, we, your people, boldly ask you to cause your waters of peace, provision, and protection to flow down on us like rivers. Let us be witnesses of your faithfulness in this hour of the world's greatest need. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
today, I wanted us to share together in an affirmation of faith, mostly because of the sermon that I just preached. Several months ago, one of our church members saw a unique affirmation of faith that we had used in worship and told me it never occurred to me that I could write my own affirmation of faith. At one point, I invited members of our congregation to do just that, and I never got a single submission. I think it's because we find it hard to articulate our faith in our own words. And so sometimes we just need to say out loud what it is we believe. And so today I invite you to join me as we articulate our faith using this statement of faith of the United Church of Canada. It's one of my favorites. Let us affirm our faith in God. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, and life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
go into the world this day to live as a child of God, a follower of Jesus Christ, one who has struck the rock of faith and who has feasted on the wellsprings of God's love. Go in peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.